Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Joseph Chilton. I'm a staff attorney with Legal Aid of North Carolina in the Smoky Mountains offices uh, out here west of Asheville. Uh, our offices are in, in Silva and Hayesville, but we're part of the statewide uh, Legal Aid of, of North Carolina umbrella. Um, and this afternoon, I'm going to be doing a, a one of our housing on Monday evening presentations on rental issues that come up um, specifically for mobile and manufactured homes. Uh, I'll be joined by Aline Snyder. Uh, she is a JD candidate in the class of 2021 at Duke University, and she did a great job preparing the visuals for this pre presentation. And she'll also be kind of moderating a, a question and answer segment when we get done um, going through the, the prepared remarks this afternoon. So when we're talking about rental issues that uh, deal with mobile and manufactured homes, the, the rights and the laws that apply are really going to depend on the individual's uh, interest in both the land and uh, the mobile home itself. Uh, if, if the person owns the mobile home and they own the land that it's on, well, that's not really a landlord-tenant situation, and that's not really the, um, the focus of this presentation. Um, however, one exception to that, a lot of people are, are buying the homes under uh, what are generally referred to as rent-to-own agreements or uh, lease agreements with an option to purchase. And if those are the case, then landlord-tenant laws will still apply until the option to purchase has been exercised. Uh, that, those are governed under uh, 47G of the North Carolina General Statutes, but there is a cross-reference there to Chapter 42, which is the general landlord-tenant laws, and they say that, you know, um, if somebody defaults under one of those rent-to-own contracts, then they can be subject to being evicted under Chapter 42. Um, one thing about that is th those agreements do have a right to, to cure um, the default at least once a year prior to the eviction being entered. But besides those, this isn't really geared towards people who, who own the mobile home and own, own the, the land itself, both. It's geared more to two other different situations. One is people who rent their mobile home and they rent the lot uh, that the mobile home sits on. And in those situations, your general landlord tenant laws from chapter 42 which that chapter talks about how much note, notice has to be given, um, when a landlord uh, can uh, file for summary ejectment, the process that controls that, uh, the landlord's obligations with, with, in terms of repairs and security deposits, all those laws are in chapter 42. And if somebody rents a mobile home and rents the lot, those general uh, provisions from chapter 42 are gonna apply. However, if they own their own mobile home but just rent the lot that the mobile home is sitting on, there are some uh, specific provisions that are found in chapter 42 and then also over in chapter 44A that may apply to depending on uh, the specifications of that mobile home. And so that'll really be the focus here uh, for people are the provisions that are specific to mobile homes uh, in the rental laws in North Carolina and what are people's rights there. So the first special rule that comes up a lot with mobile homes is the issue of what type of notice is sufficient to terminate a tenancy. Um, now, we're not talking about terminating a tenancy for breaching the lease or for not paying rent. Uh, we're talking about terminating a tenancy at the end of the tenancy just because the landlord does not want to renew it for whatever reason. Um, in those situations, if you have a year-to-year -year lease, the landlord needs to give one month's notice from the end of the year. If you have a month-to-month -month lease, the landlord would need to give one week's notice from the end of the month. And if you have a week-to-week -week lease, the landlord would need to give two days notice from the end of the week. Um, now, there's a, an important distinction there uh, is that it's not just one month's notice or one week's notice or two days notice. And a lot of times you'll see a landlord who's come to court um, maybe on a month-to-month -month lease and they've given, uh, you know, if it's a month-to-month -month and it runs from the first of the month to the end of the month and they came in on the 15th and gave the tenant a 30-day notice that says be out in 30 days by the 15th of next month, well, that's not sufficient because it has to give them through the end of the month, which makes sense because you're paying for a month every time you pay your, 
your rent. And so it would really be a 45 day notice in that case, because it has to be at least 30 days. And then through the end of that, uh, or it has to be at least seven days notice for a month to month lease. And then through the end of that month. So even though they've given a 30 day notice, it's not uh, enough. And it's more than the seven days that would be required in the statute. It's still not enough because it doesn't give you through the end of the month that you're that they're trying to terminate you, uh, if that makes sense. Now there is a special rule here when you're terminating a tenancy for somebody who rents the lot but owns the manufactured home that is on the lot. Um, now, what is a manufactured home uh, under the meaning of that statute? That's a structure transportable in one or more sections, which in the traveling mode is eight feet or more in width, 40 more in length, or when erected on the side is 320 or more square feet, built on a permanent chassis and designed to be used as a dwelling. We can go through all that, but generally speaking, uh, you know, you can read that for yourself, but generally speaking, if you have a single wide or a double wide uh, and, it, and it has a permanent chassis, um, then it's, it's probably gonna be considered a manufactured home and get you the special protections there. Uh, and, and so if a tenant owns the manufactured home and is just renting a lot, then the notice to terminate must be uh, 60 days before the end of the current rental period. Now, so that is longer than the required uh, termination notice under any of the provisions, uh, the general provisions that apply depending on week to week, month to month, year to year, whatever, it's longer than any of those. But it is worth noting that the 60 days is the general uh, provision that applies regardless of whether it's a week to week or a month to month or a year to year. There's no difference uh, when you're dealing with a manufactured home that's owned by the tenant on the lot. It's still just a 60 days notice before the end of the, of the rental period. However, that end of the rental period still applies. So a landlord couldn't, you know, on a, one, on a yearly lease that started in January, the landlord couldn't come in in April and give a 60 days notice, they would have to give 60 days before the end of the year that they're in. Um, another special rule uh, that has to do with manufactured homes talks about what if the owner of a manufactured home community wants to convert that to another purpose. So what is a manufactured home community? That's a parcel of land that's been designed to accommodate at least five manufactured homes. So if the owner of that park wants to convert the whole thing or a part of it, wants to get out of the game and convert it to another use, they need to give the notice of the intended conversion to the owner of any manufactured home that's on that lot at least 180 days before they're required to, to vacate it. And again, um, that notice doesn't depend on the weekly or the monthly or the yearly nature of the tenancy. It's 180 days regardless, but that is uh, what applies when the owner wants to basically shut down the mobile home park and convert it to another use or, or just a part of it. Another thing that is important to remember here um, is that these rules are, are, are just the baseline established by the statute. You can always get more rights than the statute from the contract that you have with your landlord. So always check your lease because it might give you a 30 day notice uh, from the landlord on a month to month instead of a, a week's notice or something like that. So just remember these are the baselines and, and there can be more notice required by uh, the lease itself. So what happens um, if the landlord gives the tenant a proper notice and the, and the tenant still doesn't leave? Well, basically um, the landlord would have two options at that point. The first option is they can refuse to accept any more rental payments from the tenant and evict the tenant. And they would file a complaint for eviction in small claims court and, and proceed there. The second option they have is to accept the, the tenant's next rental check and start a new tenancy. So they can't have their cake and eat it too. They can't accept their rent for the month they stay after the landlord has purported to, to terminate the tenancy and still evict them. Um, if they accept the rent, then you've started over uh, on a brand new tenancy that they would have to terminate again with proper notice. So what type of tenancy does it become after they've, um, after the landlord has accepted rent and the new tenancy has started? Well, that depends on 
the nature of the original tenancy. If it was for a year or more, then it becomes a new year's tenancy. If it was for less than a year, I believe it goes by the intervals that rent is paid. So it would generally become either a month to month or week to week. And then if they wanted to, um, if the landlord wanted to end that new month to month tenancy, then they would have to give another seven days notice by the end of the month um, and then not take the rent the next time and then uh, sue to evict them as a holdover tenant. Now, it's important to note that these rules we're talking about apply when the landlord doesn't want to renew the lease, but they don't apply to other grounds for eviction, specifically for non-payment of rent. In that case, um, the, the, the rule, unless the lease says otherwise, the rule from the statute is that the landlord has to give the tenant a notice of what they're behind and give them 10 days to pay it. And then if they don't make that payment within 10 days, um, then they can uh, file a complaint in eviction. And then the, the tenant then has the right to what's called tender anytime up until a judgment is entered. Tender means you pay the amount the landlord has said you're behind, plus their, their court costs, you know, their filing fee and service fee and what have you, and, and you can stay in the unit. But that, and then if, if you breach your lease, um, that is not impacted by the 60-day rule for manufactured homeowners. The 10-day rule for non-payment of eviction is not in, impacted, or non-payment of rent is not impacted by the 60-day rule for manufactured homeowners. We're just talking about situations where the uh, owner is not wanting to uh, renew the lease. Now, the other thing that is slightly different for uh, manufactured homeowners and in mobile home cases is what happens if to the mobile home tenant's property if they are evicted. So the process, the eviction process basically works like this. The, the landlord will go in, they'll, they'll file a complaint in small claims court. Uh, right now, uh, those can be scheduled anytime within 30 days under um, some directives related to the, the COVID situation that uh, just got extended. But generally, the, the, your small claims hearing on the eviction complaint is going to be held within seven days. Um, and then you'll, you'll have your hearing in front of a magistrate. If the magistrate rules against the tenant and the tenant doesn't appeal, then that becomes final in 10 days. And then the landlord can apply to the clerk of court uh, and they can get what's called a writ of possession, which the sheriff then goes out and, and executes uh, that writ within five days and forces the, the tenant off of the property. So when that happens and the, and the tenant has been forced out, well, what if they've not been able to get all their stuff out yet? What happens to their property? Well, the, the general rule, and this is again, what would apply to people who rent both the mobile home and they rent the lot that the mobile home is sitting on is that the landlord can advance one month of storage costs to the sheriff's office who takes the stuff and store it. They usually aren't going to do that. They don't want to advance the one month of storage costs, at least in our part of the state out here in the mountains. So it's more common for them to um, sign something for the sheriff's office that will allow the property to remain in the unit, at least uh, in the short term. And so then at that point, uh, the landlord has to wait seven days after the sheriff puts them in possession by the through the writ to dispose or sell of the property, generally speaking. Um, and at, at any time during that seven days, if the tenant makes a request to the landlord to get their stuff, maybe they've, you know, they're waiting on a truck or they didn't have anywhere to take it and now they do. If they make a request during that seven days, then the landlord must release the property to the tenant during uh, regular business hours or uh, if the parties, if the landlord and the tenant want to agree to a separate time that's outside of regular business hours, they can agree to that too. Then if the, if the tenant doesn't request and get their property within that seven days, the landlord can dispose of it or they can sell it. Um, so if they want to sell it, they need to give the tenant seven days advance notice as to the time and the date um, that the sale is going to happen. And they need to mail that to the tenant's 
uh, last known address. So it's for this reason and for uh, security deposit and various reasons, even if you're getting evicted and moving out, it's a good idea to uh, leave your landlord uh, a forwarding address or an address where they can reach you for various reasons. So they mail that notice to the tenant um, of the sale that's going to happen in at least seven days. And the tenant, even after um, they haven't gotten the property during the seven days, anytime up until the day before the sale, the tenant can still go and request their property and get it. But then if the sale actually happens, um, then the tenant is still entitled to the surplus of the amount that was made at the sale of their property after the landlord recovers unpaid rent and, uh, and some other ex expenses, which can be you know, storage of the property, uh, any damages, uh, the sale costs after all of that. So let's say the tenant had a, a large amount of furniture that was sold for whatever reason, and it's gonna far exceed the uh, amount of damages and storage fees that the landlord had. Well, then at, the tenant would have seven days after the sale to request that surplus be returned to them and, and the landlord would, would have to pay that. There are two other options uh, in the general rule that the landlord has. They aren't generally used, but the landlord does have the right to uh, take the stuff to a thrift store if it's worth $750 or less. What's left in the, in the rental unit is left $750 or less. They can take it to a thrift store that agrees to hold it for uh, the tenant for 30 days before they sell it at the thrift store. And then the other option is if, it, if the value of what's left on the premises is $500 or less, the landlord can treat it after, as abandoned after uh, five days. Now we don't see those two options used very often just because coming up with that valuation of 500 or 750, I think um, would create a liability issue uh, and not be very wise for a landlord if they just disposed of the property after five days and didn't do the correct protocol. And then the tenant came back and said, hey, my stuff was not worth less than $500. And, and I think landlords realize that. And so they don't use those two options very much. But theoretically, um, I suppose they could. Now, getting to the specific rule that applies in a lot of mobile home cases, what happens if the tenant owns the manufacturing home and is renting the lot uh, and they don't get it out by the time the sheriff serves the writ. And again, that same long convoluted manufactured home definition from earlier in this slideshow is gonna apply to this definition as well. So, you know, it can cost upwards of $5,000 to move a manufactured home. Um, it can take more time to hire, you know, get up the money and then arrange with somebody who can haul it to you, find a place for it to go. Sometimes that's just not going to happen in the time frame that you have after losing um, a, a, a small claims case. And if you, especially if you don't appeal, um, you're, you're looking at a writ probably being, being uh, executed in about two weeks after a small claims judgment. Um, and, and, and coming up with the money, finding somebody to, uh, to move the move it, finding a place to move it, just it's it's not practical uh, in a lot of in a lot of cases for that. And so there is a, a a special rule here that the owner of the manufactured home gets 21 days um, to move it after the writ has been executed. But if they don't move it, and the manufactured home is worth more than $500, then the the landlord gets what's called a possessory lien on the, the personal property that's left on the lot. Um, and that lien is, uh, is gonna be for unpaid rent, uh, necessary damages uh, beyond ordinary wear and tear to the lot, the reasonable costs and expenses of the sale. And then after that 21 days, they can enforce that lien by uh, going and having a public sale um, of the of the mobile home there at that point or the manufactured home i should say and if they're going to do that then the first bits of proceeds are going to go to whatever secured interest there is in the mobile home and then the next bit of proceeds are going to go to their lien um, and then after that any surplus would go to the, the the tenant but but the mobile home would then be sold at that point if they do elect to have the sale 
then they need to advertise that sale. Uh, it's generally a 20-day advertisement at the courthouse with a notice mailed uh, to the tenant. They can advertise, that 20-day advertisement can run during the 21-day the period when the tenant is entitled to get their mobile home. They just can't have the sale until the tenant's um, not picked up the mobile home or manufactured home and that lien attaches after 21 days. So one other issue that we get a good bit out here in the mountains is what about campers? Uh, we have a lot of people who, you know, maybe have a, a camper or a recreational vehicle and they rent a mobile home space and then they get evicted. And there's a lot of confusion out there about whether um, that falls within the landlord tenant protections of chapter 42. Well, the landlord tenant laws say that they apply uh, to premises that include mobile homes and mobile home spaces. Um, the statute lists some exclusions. Uh, it talks about uh, it talks about uh, motels for transient occupancy are not included. It talks about vacation rentals are not included, but it doesn't list uh, campgrounds or RV spaces or anything like that among the exclusions. Um, so, and and when you think about it you know, it is a home that's mobile and a lot of people do use it for a permanent residence. So I think that does lead to an argument that while maybe um, not all mobile homes, all manufactured homes might be mobile homes, but not all mobile homes are manufactured homes. There'd be a difference there and something that is, maybe wouldn't fit the definition of manufactured homes for that, those special protections we've talked about could still fit uh, as being a mobile home for the general protections under chapter 42. Now, there is um, no case law definitively settling that issue yet. Uh, the closest case was about a decade ago. There was a case called Shepherd versus Bonita Vista Properties. And in that case, it came out of a, an RV park down east where uh, there were multiple plaintiffs and the uh, park owner had, had disconnected their utilities in a way that damaged their RVs. They went ahead and moved out and they all sued um, alleging unfair and deceptive trade practices. The, the trial court said that uh, the landlord tenant rules from chapter 42 did apply. And then also there were some Public Utilities Act violations that applied and, and ruled in their favor on unfair and deceptive trade practices. Uh, on the appeal, the, the plaintiffs won again on the appeal by a two to one margin. Um, unfortunately, the, the majority didn't really settle the issue. They said, regardless of whether the landlord tenant laws applied, um, there were still unfair and deceptive trade practices because the campground owner was selling electricity and they unhooked it and various other things. So they didn't really uh, affirm the trial court's application of chapter 42, the landlord tenant laws, uh, two campgrounds cases there. And the dissent uh, was very adamant that the landlord tenant laws do not apply to mobile home spaces, but a dissent is not controlling law. So as far as I can tell, having looked into the issue, um, there's nothing definitively saying that it doesn't, that the landlord tenant protections don't apply to people who rent campground spaces. And I think that as long as it's not a vacation uh, transient type uh, occupancy of that space. If it is somebody that's using it for their permanent uh, long-term residence, then I think that the Shepherd versus Bonita Vista case shows that trial courts are willing to say that uh, the landlord tenant, the general landlord tenant laws apply in that case. And, um, and, and there's a good argument there that they do. So at this point, that would be uh, all of the main points that I had hoped to discuss today. And I was going to bring Helene in and see if she had any uh, questions uh, for me. I think there are a few uh, frequently asked questions. Uh, the first question is, I own my mobile home and rent the lot. What happens if I'm evicted from the lot but cannot move my mobile home within the 21 day period? Okay, so uh, I mean, uh, since we're talking about the 21 day period, I'm assuming 
we're talking about the manu uh, a mobile home that meets that definition of manufactured home that would uh, set off the, the possessory lien statute and give them 21 days to get it and then the possessory lien sale. So after the uh, 21 days run, the owner of the, the mobile home can extinguish the lien prior to the sale by giving the, the, um, the landlord essentially the, the amount of the lien plus their sale costs, et cetera. And at that point, the lien would be extinguished and they could uh, move the, the camper at that point at any point before the sale. Now, if they're not gonna be able to move it, unfortunately, there, there's really not a lot of point to extinguishing that lien and then it would go to sale um, and, and they would get what's left over after paying the lien and any secured interest on the manufactured home if they weren't able to extinguish the lien and get it moved and, and the, the manufactured home was sold under Chapter 44A. Okay, uh, great. And then the second question is, what happens if I do not receive proper notice of eviction far enough in advance if I'm asked to leave the mobile home lot? Okay, um, so if you, let's say, own the manufactured home uh, and it's on, on a lot that you rent and the, the landlord gives, and you're on a month-to-month -month lease, and the landlord gives you a standard seven days from the end of the month to get out and, and doesn't apply the special rule for a manufactured home, well then, North Carolina has a lot of case law that, that says uh, lease terminations require strict compliance with the notice provisions because the law does not, despite what may happen in, in, in practice, the law says it doesn't favor lease forfeitures. Um, and so it is a defense to eviction that you didn't get the, the adequate notice. And then at that point, um, the landlord should be able, should be required to, to start all over. I've got this book, it's North Carolina Small Claims Law. It's put out by the UNC School of Government. It's really what magistrates are, are, will go by most of the time in uh, eviction hearings. And it talks about if the landlord, this is on page 163, it says if the landlord does not give notice as required by the lease statute or regulation, the tenant is entitled to remain in possession, but is required to pay rent for the next period. And the landlord must then give a new notice at the proper time before the end of the next period that he or she wishes to terminate the lease. So at that point, you know, you should win your small claims hearing and then the landlord would have to come in and give a new 60 day notice uh, that terminates you at the end of a, a proper rental period with at least 60 days notice from the end of that rental period. Okay, great. And then the third question is, uh, what do I do if I'm behind on my mobile home lot rent payments because of COVID? Are there any protections for me to stop eviction from the lot? Um, there are a few. So if the if you're behind on rent that is from May 31st through uh, June 20th, the effective dates of one of Governor Cooper's um, orders, then the landlord should afford a, a six month payment plan under that order and, and shouldn't be able to evict you um, for non-payment of June's rent um, until that six month payment plan has been, has been attempted. Another thing is if it's a, a covered property under the CARES Act, uh, there may be a defense there depending on the nature of the, um, the landlord's mortgage, the CARES Act might apply and we're not quite to the end of that CARES Act eviction moratorium yet. Uh, that, that does expire later this month, but it's currently still still covered. And then um, another thing is a lot of community action agencies have funds under the CARES Act uh, that are specifically designed to help people with COVID related uh, housing expenses um, that could help you catch up and, and be able, if it's a, an eviction for non-payment of rent, uh, be able to tender, which is that defense that we uh, talked about earlier. And then also there may be other defenses or counterclaims um, or negotiation that may be able to be had uh, that, that would benefit from having legal counsel. So I would always encourage people to, to call Legal Aid of North Carolina or, or another um, provider of legal services uh, if they're being faced with eviction due to a COVID related hardship. Great, I think those are all the questions I have on my end. <laughs> okay, thank you. 
Uh, well, at this point, I think that would be um, all of my presentation. I, I uh, appreciate everybody joining, and I hope that we were able to give some good information uh, and help somebody here today.